Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning, happy Sabbath. pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us back to your holy place. We thank you for an opportunity to just come and worship and give you all the praise, Father, for what you have done for us to now and what you're doing right now in this place. So fill us with your spirit, dwell with us now, and lift us up to where you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath, church family. It is good to be back here worshiping with you at Living Water. Amen? Amen. In fact, as you know, we have been meeting every second Sabbath of the month now since June. And this is our first transition Sabbath where we're meeting for the second time this week, or the second time this month, and we'll be meeting twice every month through the end of the year. Amen? Amen. With launching weekly services this January. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 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 Well, listen, I praise God that he's kept us through these last three weeks since we met and how he's brought us here together, I know he has a special blessing for your life today. You know, I was just, I was talking to a friend. Um, he follows the news, very keen on the news. And he was asking about, um, you know, what I thought about this uh, high profile, um, high profile uh, questioning, interrogations going on there at the Senate this last couple days and just, you know, he said this and she said that, you know, it was a, essentially a court case that someone needs to produce a, a verdict. And he's really caught up in all these events and, and, and the impact it would have on and how the nation follows this thing. The thing is, I told him, I said, I know it's all important, well and good, but the truth is, you know, we are in a court case ourselves. A far more important court case that most people don't even know they're a part of. And the judgment is about to take set. And the question is, will you be found innocent on that day? That's the only case that we really need to know well and true today. Amen? Amen. And the thing is, we have nothing to worry about because we know the judge. We know who our attorney is. And Jesus said he is the faithful witness. In other words, your case is fixed. It's rigged. He bought off your life. And he paid it with his blood. And that's what we're here to celebrate today. Amen? Amen. So with that, I want to invite Desiree to come lead us up as we give our songs and praise and worship to our judge, our attorney, our witness, our redeemer and savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath again, church. As we are about to start singing some praises to our God, I just wanted to reflect briefly over the past two weeks. I've had a really 
a rough time at work over the past two weeks. I'm usually pretty low keyed about my work, nothing much happening, but um, I actually applied for a job that I didn't get and I was really hurt about it. And someone was telling me, you know, Desiree, it will get better, things will get better. You don't know what God has in store for you. And it just so happened that this week, I another job that I applied for, I got it. And I said to myself, well, look at that. The things that you thought you wanted, God has something else prepared for you. And regardless of what, how angry I may have felt or disappointed, there's always that little voice that will tell you, calm down, don't get upset. song for this week and also in looking over the lesson that we were studying I think God placed this song in my heart to share with you to remind you that regardless of what's going on in our world today don't think, don't fool yourself into thinking that things will get better, they will only get better when God returns to take us home but in the interim just think peace be still and allow God to work things out for you so the first thing we're going to sing is Master the Tempest is Raging, the Billows are Tossing High, the Sky is Overshadowed with Blackness, No Shelter or Help is Nigh, and at the end of it we'll sing Thank you. 
to share an update for our community spotlight. Um, many of you got the emails that we had victims from the hurricane and the floods in North Carolina relocated all the way up here to Maryland. I mean, that is how many victims there were that North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, there wasn't place enough that they had to send some all the way over here to College Park. In fact, we had a number of them located right down the street here at Ritchie Coliseum on Route 1. It was started out with about 40 individuals, families, children ages 2 through 12 living temporarily on a basketball court, just a tarmac to the floor. And Adventist Community Services contacted the Living Water Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen? Did God place us here on time to be his witness? And so he contacted us and said, this is the situation. Is there anything your church can do to help? I don't think he was even aware that we had only met three times in the existence of our church to date. But of course the answer said, yes, just tell us what's needed and we'll do whatever we can. Well, I wanna tell you, because of the generosity of you, of this church, we were able to provide truckloads of food to these families. We were able to provide hundreds of dollars in gift cards to these families, to provide clothing and gas and all kinds of necessities that we all take for granted because the care coordinator said these families lost everything everything. They lost their home. They lost all their belongings, their job, their school. Everything that they knew as life was gone. To the point, she said, that some of these families were now attempting to relocate here in Maryland because they had nothing to return to. And some of them had no way back even if they wanted to. Some of these families found friends or relatives eventually that they could go into Others had no one to turn to. Some were even moved out of this shelter and just placed in a homeless shelter by the agencies. But I tell you, God is a good God. And not a single one of these individuals leaves his sight. And I'm so happy to tell you that most of these families have now found a place to stay or they have worked their way back at least to the borders of their town, hoping to restart and rebuild their life closer to home. Now there are still some families, three in fact, still here in Maryland, planning to stay here permanently. And all the gifts that you brought in here this past week and even today, we're going to take directly to them this coming Monday. And I'll tell you, the state coordinator and the Red Cross coordinator specifically told me time and time again that nobody has done for these families what your church has done. Nobody. Yes, praise God. Because you are the church. You allowed God to use you to touch and to inspire and to encourage these people in their most desperate hour to let them know somebody cares to the point that they even gave specific requests saying i'm a nurse and i'm looking for a job here but i need scrubs i need a stethoscope i need all this stuff and the next day this church provided just that they were amazed they said they could not believe the amount of response and the timeliness of it that even the state and the Red Cross did not respond as fast as you did. The word I heard over and over and over again, no matter who I spoke to, they said, you are a godsend. And that's literally true because God sent you 
to College Park, to this place, at this time, to serve this need. You're not here by accident. You are here with a purpose. May God continue, continue to use you and this church to transform this community. People ask, how will the community know about us? We're not out in the streets. We haven't advertised. We haven't promoted with flyers and all this stuff. God sent the promotion to us. So the University of Maryland, the State Department, and the local Red Cross now know you, the Living Water Seventh-day Adventist Church. And when there is a need, they know now to call us directly because they know God will provide through his people. Amen? Amen. So I just want to remind you, if you brought any of goods, if you brought any gift cards or anything to share to these families, we have boxes right outside the main entrance there. You can leave it right there. If it's a gift card, please provide it to either the usher or the greeter who will give it to us. And at this moment, we're going to take everything that has been collected up to this date, and we're going to provide it to these families who remain on Monday. We are in constant communication now with the primary care coordinator. And we're going into a phase two of support, which we're trying to identify and understand more what those needs are. So after today, there'll be a pause on any collections until we find more detailed what these families need to get rehabilitated and get their life back together. And then look for those emails on how we can best help. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, with that being said, I can't think of a better time for us to meet our God in prayer. Amen? And so with that, I want to invite our elder, Elder Ian, to come and lead us to the throne of grace and mercy. Take the red one. This morning, the sermon is focusing on God's love, focusing on... My frustrations at work. Still, he cares about um, my getting a flat tire. Still, he cares about uh, my uh, disagreement with my wife. Still, he cares about uh, my hardships in school. Still, God, the God of all of these things, in some strange, for some strange reason, he loves me. He, God, loves and cares about me. Um, and it's an incredible thought, um, and it's a thought that uh, every time we, we take, some, take some moments to think about it, um, it can really transform our, our thinking. This morning, as we come, if you would like to come forward in prayer, um, I want to ask those who particularly for themselves or for another need a reminder this morning of God's love. I want to ask you particularly to come forward. Others, if you have other concerns or other um, things or issues you'd like to bring to God, you can come forward as well. But particularly for those who, for themselves or for someone in their life, you know this person needs to be reminded that God loves them. Or you yourself need to be reminded of this truth that God loves me. I'd ask those people in per specifically to come forward this morning.
Our Father, it's our privilege to call you our God. We thank you for the many ways that you have shown to us that you care for us. And all of us, I, I don't believe there's one person in here uh, that can say we deserve that love. And even when you have shown us that love, Father, you know that at times uh, we make light of it, uh, we disregard it. But still, you continue to pursue us. Still, continue, you continue to reach out to us uh, through big ways, through small ways. Uh, sometimes when we're down, we have just out of nowhere, someone gives us an encouraging word. Sometimes when we're busy and, and, and our minds are occupied and we're, we're, we're not thinking of your love and not thinking of your grace, uh, then you remind us, you slow us down, we hear a bird sing or we hear a song that, that speaks to our hearts and somehow you get our attention to remind us you are there and that you care for us. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for your deep and powerful love for us. But not only have you been so gracious and so patient and so kind as to show us your love in our lives, you've given us this unimaginable expression of that love by coming down to this planet that you created, living a miserable life, living a life of insignificance, living a life of rejection, living a life of difficulty, taking that for me, taking that because you knew that it was in Ian's best interest that you would walk this sinful planet. And not only that, Father, you went to the cross. Jesus bled and died so that I could have an opportunity to live forever with him. This love, this incredible display of affection, of passion, is beyond anything we can imagine. But, we, but today we again say thank you, Father. Today we again say thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. And today some of us here that have come forward are especially asking that you remind us of that. Things happen to us that make us not feel so loved. Other people don't love us the way they should. People that we expect to love us, that, that should love us, they, they don't treat us the way they ought. And it, it somehow causes us to doubt maybe we are not worth loving. Maybe we are not that valuable. But today I'm asking in Jesus' name that you will reveal to us, to those who need it, that God loves you, that God cares, that you are valuable in the sight of God, that there is not another like you, that only only the life of Jesus was worth your salvation. And for those also that we know of friends, we know of, of loved ones, that they need a revelation of your love. We're praying for them today as well. And we're asking that through some means, maybe through our own words, through our own encouragement, through our own actions, that you will reveal to them that God loves you that God cares, that, that he's there despite all of the things that happen, all the craziness that you're experiencing, that God is there, God cares, and God loves you. Today we bring these things to you knowing confidently that you, you have shown you were more than willing and desirous to show how much you love humanity. You went to the cross to do it. So today we ask again that you will show your everlasting love for us. Also, Father, some of us have come with other burdens, other concerns, other cares, and so we present them to you as well. And we bring them not on our own merits, not because we've been good this week, but we bring them to you because you've promised that in the name of Jesus, we can bring anything to you and you will hear and answer. So in Jesus' name, we present to you our burdens, we present to you our requests, we present to you our needs, and ask that you will do only what you want to do, what is best. Yet you will do maybe not what we're asking, maybe not what we think, but you will do what you and all power and all wisdom know is best. We commit these things to you and we pray that you will help us to trust you um, despite what you may answer that may not be what we desire. We ask your blessing now as we continue in this worship service. Uh, we thank you for the, the Bible. We thank you for the word. And as we focus on this, this passage, as we look at the love of God for us, we pray that you will make it plain, that you will bless Pastor Neil as he opens the word to us, that he will have wisdom from above, that he will have the spirit of God speaking to and through him and that we may hear the voice of you, the voice of our loving Savior speaking to us today. We commit these things to you and thank you, Father, that we know we can present them to you in confidence. In Jesus' name, amen. Cast all our cares upon you. 
for a very special children's story from Auntie Ashley. <laughs> Thank you. All right, boys and girls. Have a seat. All right, good morning. How are you? Good. So today I'm going to tell you a story about God's love for us and what He has done for us, okay? So, okay, so I'm going to tell you a story about this little boy named Deuce. What's his name? Deuce, okay? So Deuce and his dad, oh, they love having so much fun together. They like going outside, playing basketball, playing football. They love to do so many things. And so one day, Deuce's dad decided to take him to work with him. Deuce's dad works at a bridge. He's a bridge operator. So his job is to open the bridge so that when a boat wants to come and go by the bridge, it can go. And his job is to close it when a train is, it's time for a train to go by, okay? And so this day, Deuce loves going to the trains. He loves watching the trains go by. He loves listening to it. He just loves going to his dad's job. And so one day, Deuce saw that a train was coming, but the dad didn't see the train coming. And the bridge was up. So he's trying to call out to his dad, Daddy, Daddy, the bridge, the, tr the train is coming. You got to put down the bridge. And so the dad didn't hear him. And so this time, Deuce said, okay, what am I going to do? I have to save the train. And so there was a little button that Deuce had to push. When Deuce tried to push the little button, he fell into the hole. Okay? And Deuce's dad saw that he fell into this little hole. Deuce's dad had to make a decision, just like God had to make a decision on whether or not he wanted to save us, okay? So just like God had sacrificed his son for us so that we can be here on earth and, and have our sins being taken care of, he had to, Deuce's dad had to do the same thing. So Deuce's dad made a decision to save all the hundreds of people on this earth, on the train, and so he had to sacrifice his son just like God did and save the hundreds of people, okay? That's how much God loves us. He decided that he was going to give up his son for all of you, for all of us. That's how much God loves us. God loves us this much. He loves us to the moon and back, okay? That's why God gave his son for us, for all of us. Say, for me, God gave up his son for me. Can you say that? God gave up his son for me. Okay, so whenever you feel sad or whenever you feel like you've done something wrong, just remember that God gave up his son for me. God loves me that much no matter what I do. Okay, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. All right, amen. Okay, can I have two boys and girls for prayer? Okay, Jordan and Makaya, come on. Oh, you want to do it too, Nola? Okay, come on, come on. All right, Jordan, go ahead. Can we all bow our heads and close our eyes? Dear Jesus, please help us to have a great day. Please help the people who are driving to listen to God's word. Please help them to have a safe travel and mercy day, man. Amen. All right, Makaya. Dear Jesus, please help the people who, li could li who are living on basketball courts. Please help them to ha get food and find a house. And please help us to have a good day today. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you, God. Thank you for all the day. And so uh, they go for the uh, so name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, 
Um, the children are going to come around to collect offering for the children's ministry. So go ahead, boys and girls. Make sure you say thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, today's Bible reflection will be brought to us by our scripture minister for the day, Quan Bailey. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, now, Quan, you want to tell us how old you are? You're talking to the mic. I'm 12. 12. And what school do you go to, Quan? Tacoma. Tacoma? So now that is um, Tacoma Academy Prep School, right? TAPS? Yeah, uh, I used to go there, but it was known as Sligo back then. So, so uh, you and I, we share a, a, an intimate connection in school. You know that? You didn't know that, see? We're on the same team. <laughs> Tell me, what's your favorite sport that you play at school? Soccer. You play soccer? What's your favorite team? Arsenal. Arsenal. Okay, okay. Well, you know, as much as Quan loves soccer, he loves Jesus even more. Amen? Amen. And he's here serving Jesus today. So, Quan, why don't you go ahead and lead us in our scripture reading for today? Okay, so today we will be reading John 3, verse 16 to 21. Do we have the right page? Amen. Okay. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He believeth on him is, he, be, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that that light is come into that light is come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For every for every one that doeth evil hateth light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Amen. May God bless the word of his, may God bless his holy word. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kwan. Praise God, Kwan. Thank you for that. 
Our special music today will be brought to us by Brother Stephen Adetumbi. Brother Stephen, lead us to the throne. Good morning. Good morning. Is this the morning? Yeah. It is. Thank you. It's good to see you guys look so great. You know, I'm going to sing a song. It's, um, uh, it's, it's over the years has become one of my favorites because it talks about grace. And you know what I found? That the number one way to be motivated to the kind of life that God wants you to live is to understand that God is having grace and mercy on you every day. Mm. You know, you, it's very difficult to be motivated by rules or laws. But when you see somebody loves you, when you see somebody doing something for you when you don't deserve it, you just, it motivates, it wells you up and say, I want to be like that. It inspires you. So I hope that you're inspired by the love and the grace of God and the story of Jesus Christ as I sing this song. We can go home now, Stephen. Ready to turn off the lights and shut this thing down. 
praise God. He looked beyond my faults. All the many, many faults. Oh, I saw my need. Praise God for you, Stephen, and your ministry. You know, Stephen, I have to admit, when you walked in here, I didn't recognize you. Because on your CD, I think you got a hat on. And, and the truth is, I think you're in the CD player of my car right now. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, that voice sounds familiar to me. <laughs> I know this brother, I just didn't know I knew this brother. So praise God. If you, y'all need to get his CD. It'll be in your car too. <laughs> It'll be in your car too. Praise God for you, Steve, and praise God for you. Uh, you know, there is a, uh, if you look at your bulletin today and you look at the sermon title, it says Birth of a Nation. For those of you who are here last time, you would know that was the same sermon from last week. And so, you know, I figured I was up here, church was full, most of you were asleep, so I figured well, they won't notice if I gave the same message anyway, right? But actually, it was a mistake by the person who does the bulletins. You know, they can't be trusted. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that person is me. So <laughs> last night, someone said, you preaching the same message again? I said, no, what are you talking about? I said, you know, it's in the bulletin. I said, oh, man, that associate pastor? <laughs> they said, you are the associate pastor. I said, I know, I know. Well, we are continuing in our journey with Jesus through the book of John. And we're actually continuing in our story of Jesus and Nicodemus. We're focusing our attention on maybe the most famous verse in the Bible. Perhaps the most famous statement in the history of man. John chapter 3, verse 16. And a message I've entitled, Radicalizing the Gospel. So I invite you to pray with me and pray for me as we seek God in his presence, as we open his word once again. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being here, because we have felt your presence here. You're moving in our hearts. Now, Lord, open our hearts and minds to hear your voice. Teach us what you want us to learn. Hide me, Father, because I bring nothing to this table. But let us all see Jesus lifted up and drawing us unto him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Radicalizing the gospel. You know, John 3.16, I was born and raised in the church, and it, of the, it's the first verse that you memorize, John 3.16, because you hear it over and over and over again. I mean, I used to be big in a football. I used to watch the Redskins religiously, religiously. And uh, I mean, I, I would spend, you know, from, from 12 o'clock in the afternoon to 12 o'clock at midnight just watching football all Sunday long, right? And you would see even in the games, right, there'd be somebody behind the goal post with a sign, John 3.16, John 3.16. I mean, you would see this thing anywhere and everywhere to the point for me, and I suspect for many others, like a song you hear over and over and over again, it got played out. And this verse had lost all meaning to me because... It was just the same words, time and time and time again. And it wasn't until later in my journey with Jesus, when I found myself at the foot of his throne, that he brought me back to this verse. And he filled it with such meaning that it went from this verse that had just been tossed aside, that I now related to sporting events more than anything else, to being the most powerful and impactful scripture in my life, then, today, and I imagine tomorrow and into eternity. Radicalizing the gospel. You know, if you look out in, 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 in today's society, in pop culture today, whether it's here in the U.S. or even around the world, this, this trend of, like, superheroes and comic books of like, what, what is it, the Avengers or Superman, and these things are this multi-billion dollar industry that has taken the world by storm. Like, I looked up some of the numbers, I think, 
um, some of these, these most recent movies, uh, the Avengers made over a billion dollars worldwide. Black Panther, billions of dollars. Just constantly, consistently. And you ask any of these people who, who love watching this stuff, there, and you know, some people just say, well, it's just entertainment. But there's a reason you're entertained. There's a reason that it appeals to you. And it can be appealing for different reasons. Some people, you know, they, they find this, this, this story of good versus evil. Or some people, they relate to, to somebody, some, some person in the story. Or some people, they want to be like some superhero in that story. But you ask any of these people, all of them will tell you it's not real. Right? They'll tell you it's not real. No one actually believes that there's these superheroes with these superpowers that go flying around fighting these villains who have come to earth to destroy its people or to take over and rule as their king. Now, they, they love to be entertained by this, but they'll all say, I mean, that's too hard to believe. It's, it's fake. And we look at those things and we'll tell the same thing. We're like, of course it's fake. It's not real. It's crazy. But you, have you thought about your faith? I mean, the fact that you're sitting in a church today, the story of your faith is far more unbelievable than all the stories of Hollywood combined. You sit there and watch this movie or you tell these people like, oh, well, of course, these, these great gods of powers are battling with one another over the fate of humanity. Yeah, of course, that's not real. And yet we sit here today believing that there is a God that we cannot see, we cannot touch, we cannot feel. And he is fighting this enemy who has come to earth to destroy, to murder, to capture as his own. How different is your story from theirs? But you want to quickly tell them, well, that's not real. Why can't they turn to you and say, well, how is yours any more real? Radicalizing the gospel. You know, the thing is, when you look at how and why the gospel spread the way it did, it's because it is a radical story. No one had heard anything like the gospel story before. Nothing. Yes, the, everyone believed in gods before then. And yes, there was all this mythology and all this stuff. But even those who believed in all that were captivated by the gospel because it went above and beyond even their stories and myths. And I contend with you today one of the reasons, one of the issues that we have today in sharing the gospel is because we have taken the power out of the gospel. People look at Christianity today as some kind of soft story. It's for the soft-hearted. It's for those who need a crutch to lean on. And they've taken the epicness, the grandness, of this story, the power of what it is, right out. You know, when people talk about radicalizing the gospel, you use that term, and they'll think that, oh, they're trying to add these new things to the gospel or make it something that it wasn't. No, I contend with you today, Christianity today has made the gospel what it is not, what is some weak, silly little story. While the world looks upon all these superheroes as some kind of grand and epic and awesome thing, we need to re-radicalize the gospel. We need to show this world a true superhero. Radicalizing the gospel. You know, God loves to take the devil and his works and turn it for his own. Amen? Amen? And the devil's got the whole world chasing after superheroes today. 
And we know the Bible says that in the end time, the devil himself is going to come and he is going to perform such signs and wonders that if it was possible, even the very elect would be deceived. The people are ready to see a hero. They are ready to see a savior. They just don't know that he's already here in the pages of this book. This is the most radical and awesome story that we have kept hidden for far too long. Far too long. And right there in John chapter 3 and verse 16, the entire summary of this awesome and grand epic battle is all neatly and wonderfully tied together. So I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 3 and verse 16. John chapter 3 and verse 16. Jesus is continuing his discussion with Nicodemus. And as Nicodemus was this spiritual seeker of truth, it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus lay bare these most powerful words. And yes, I do submit to you, these are the most powerful words given in humanity because the entire scriptures are summed up in this one simple verse. And you know, at some point here at Living Water, we're going to spend a whole series on this one verse because no matter how much time you spend on this thing, you can't even begin to unpack it. John chapter 3, verse 16, and Jesus says, for God, you can pause right there. For God. For God. I mean, right now in today's society, if you mention God, that's radical enough. When you say God and what we believe God to be, this awesome creator, sustainer, all-ruling, all-powerful, all-perfect God, that is a radical statement for God. God. Now place yourself thousands of years ago, though. Thousands of years ago, in Christ's time, that was not a question. The, the existence of a God or many gods was not a question. That wasn't radical back then. In fact, most religions outside of Judaism and monotheism believed in a litany of gods, hundreds if not thousands of gods. That would not be radical. The fact that they claim there to be one God, one true God, that was a radical statement. That would have pricked the ears of the Romans and the Greeks and all those around because they've never heard of such a thing before. Just one who is perfect. You know mythology. You know the gods are always fighting and contending with each other, fighting for power, fighting for rule. They would come down to earth to visit and to, to subdue, to control. They would have children. It was just the people who made up their gods instilled them with the humanity that they knew because they could not create a God that they couldn't understand. But the God of the Bible is a God that we can't begin to comprehend. So that was radical. But what about for the Jews? The Jews believed in God. They believed in the one true God. But I think Stephen mentioned this. It's not about the do's and don'ts. It's a God of grace. And that was radical for the Jewish mind. All the rules that they had in place, all the things that they felt they had to do this, do this, do, slipped on this, oh no, that's it, I'm done. Not understanding it was a God of love, of grace, of mercy, so the truth was they knew of God, but they didn't know God. And the God that Jesus was sharing was radically different, radically different than the God that they knew. For God, for God. He starts with that most radical statement, for God. For God so loved the world 
You know, <clears throat> search throughout world religions. Search and research and understand what these gods of these other faiths stood for. There is no God that even begins to come close in comparison to the loving God of the Bible, where it is love and love and more love. Even his judgment comes out of love. We are here now because he delays that judgment, because he delays it, because he loves us. He knows we're not ready. There's not that timetable on his end because we're his timetable. He delays out of love. Love from Genesis into Revelation, it is love throughout. He loved the world. He didn't just love a people. He didn't just love a race. He didn't just love some subset of something, but he loved this entire world. Even the monotheistic religions of today who believe there is just one God do not have a God of such thorough and amazing love who is here next to us, in us, holding us, a personal God. Even their God is a distant God. One to be feared, one to be worshipped, but not one to love as their own. For God so loved the world. That alone, that alone, those statements alone would have been so radical to bring the minds and hearts of the hearers to understand they have never experienced something like this before. Just imagine, you read throughout Paul's writings, there were Roman rulers who wanted to hear his story. These people had everything, and they wanted to hear what this poor preacher had to say because they never heard anything like it before. Radical. Radical. For God so loved the world that he gave grace. We didn't have to earn it. We didn't have to make pilgrimages. We didn't have to buy it. We didn't have to do any of the things that all these other religions so often need to do. You know, I remember on a missionary trip to India, they have temples at almost every corner. As you go to the villages and cities, almost every corner there is a shrine or a temple that is covered in idols and statues of the various Hindu deities and gods. And you will find there, near the entrance or at the side or at the little shrine, you will see people faithfully following what they know, performing all kinds of acts whether it's, you know, constantly bending, jumping, holding their ears, all kinds of things I can't even begin to describe. There are people who come and lay huge amounts of money on the plates there before these shrines, trying to purchase their forgiveness, their healing, and their justification. How many Christians do the same? They come in to church, hoping to buy their way into heaven with just enough tithe or just enough offering? How many Christians do the same, thinking, well, if I come and serve as a deacon or an elder or whatever, you know, I'm going to put in my work and I, I'll get, my, I'll get my, my name on that roll over there. But God says he gave. We, he didn't ask for it. We didn't earn it. He gave it. Radical. They had never seen that, never heard it. What do you mean? This all-powerful and mighty God, he loves the world, all of us, and he gives? I don't have to ask, I don't have to earn. He gives? He gives. He gives what? His only begotten son. His only begotten begotten son. Those of you who have children can only imagine what it'd be like to give your child. I can't even begin to comprehend giving up my son for a good person, let alone 
for a sinful and wicked people who rejected me and hated me. But that's what this God did. He gave his only son. And that is found nowhere in no religion anywhere that he would send his son to the people who hated him most. And yet on top of that, to make things even worse, he said, I'm going to sacrifice my son from before the foundation of this world. Even before I made you, before you could even have a chance to sin against me, before this world would be in place that I knew was going to fall, that I knew was going to turn on me, that I knew would take the cost of my own dear son, I love you so much, I'm going to do it anyway. I can't even begin to comprehend that. That is how radical that statement is. Because if any of us knew we were going to make a mistake in advance, we would do everything to make sure we don't make that mistake. That's logic. That's reasonable. But God is not logical. God is not reasonable. He is a God of radical love. You know, there are all these religious extremists out there, right? Not understanding that God is the most extreme of them all. His love is so extreme, we cannot begin to understand it. His love is so extreme that he loves even the extremists. He is the first and original and most of all the extremists that he gave his only son to die for us even while we were still sinners, even before we had a chance to become sinners from the foundation of the world. Radical, radical is this gospel that whoever believes in him, so you're telling me that all I have to do is have faith? So here is this God, this perfect and true God, who sent his son, his only begotten son, because he loves this world so much. He gave his grace that if we will just believe, if we will just have faith, and that's it, just to hold on to him, just to believe in him and in, his, in who he is and his love, for, his love for us. That if we would just believe in him, we should not perish, but have everlasting life. How many people all throughout the ages look for this fabled fountain of youth? that they would cross oceans on years-long journey, that they would sacrifice their life looking through jungles, that they would do all these things and follow these, these, these so-called spiritual leaders. And even today, people who would drink cyanide following this false leader, believing, if I would just take this, I would actually live forever. And the radical message of the gospel is, no, you just need to believe in me. Your faith in my grace, in my free gift, is all you need to live forever. So that the greatest, most powerful enemy in this world, known as death, that nobody here in and of themselves could cheat or buy or pay their way out of, he says, I've got it. And all you need to do is believe. That's it. That is a radical message. It is a radical gospel that we have. People don't know just how amazing the story of Christianity is. And that's our fault. Because we know it, and we've watered it down, and we've wilted it down to be some kind of soft thing for soft people, and oh, it's just, you know, oh, it's this thing, oh, they're Jesus believers, yeah, you know, they, they love Jesus, they love Jesus, not knowing there is this God in struggle, fighting with this grand demon who seeks the lives of this planet, 
and they are waging war right now, right next to you. The demons are fighting these angels of power over you personally. And all the effects of Hollywood couldn't begin to understand and to show this epic battle that's taking place right around us. But if we could get the people to know, if we could share this story, this gospel, this radical gospel, if they find all of this movie and all this nonsense appealing, how much more would they find this appealing? Because you know what the most radical part of the story is? It's true. It's true. And we have the proof. Nobody can prove that Superman exists. Nobody can prove that Iron Man or Joker and all these other Jokers are out there that are real. But we can prove that God is real. And that he is in battle and he is victorious over this demon known as Satan. We can prove it in his word. We can prove it through science. We can prove it through history. And most importantly, you can prove it through your life, your transformed heart. There is nothing more radical than that. So you, you are the most radical part about the gospel story. And the question is, will you now take that message to this world and let them know how radical a God we serve. I want you to listen to the words of this song as our praise team comes forward. love of God, the love of God, there is nothing more radical than that. I close with this story about the evangelist Dwight Moody. If you don't know who Dwight Moody is, he was one of the most famous Christian evangelists living in the 1800s. When travel across nations was so difficult, he was an internationally famous Christian evangelist and inspired millions over time. There's a true story I read recently about Dwight Moody. He had the words, God is love. God is love. 
written above his pulpit. And when he first began preaching, his zeal for God and God's hatred for sin kept him from understanding those three simple words, God is love. He used to preach that God was an angry God, angry with the wicked, and stood behind them with the drawn sword of judgment, ready to cut down the sinners if they did not repent as this was the style of preaching for many Christians at that time. And this is true, of course, but we know God loves the sinner while he hates the sin. Well, now, a young Englishman taught Moody, a young preacher taught this grand evangelist to preach the love of God. And this is what happened. When Moody first visited England, he met a fellow Harry Morehouse, and the people called Harry the boy preacher. He was young, looked like a kid. One day, Morehouse told Moody that he would like to go back with Moody to Chicago, where he had his church, and he would like to preach in his church, as Moody had preached there in England. Well, Moody looked at this young face, beardless fellow, and decided he was too young to preach. And he couldn't take the risk of having this young whippersnapper in front of his congregation who was accustomed to hear the great D.L. Moody. So Moody actually did not let Morehouse know the boat in which he was sailing back home to Chicago to try to avoid him. And he said, uh, in a very cold way, he said, well, if you ever come out west, just give me a call, let me know. Well, in a few days after Moody arrived in Chicago, he received a letter telling him that Morehouse would arrive in Chicago on Friday. This young guy wouldn't take no for an answer. Moody didn't know what to do. Now, he was going to be in another city that Friday and Saturday, so he wouldn't even be there to receive him or more likely block him from the pulpit. So after thinking about it for a long time and seeing no way out of this difficulty, he told his church elders, reluctantly, this young preacher from England was going to arrive on Thursday. And, uh, well, they better invite him to come and speak the two evenings while Moody was going to be away. Now, even the elders and the church leaders, they were afraid of having this young stranger coming in and spoiling the interest of the people. Again, this is D.L. Moody. Who is this child preacher who wants to come and stand before our great congregation? But Moody said, fine, let's just try him. Let's just try him. So after Moody had returned, after being away those two days, after allowing this young preacher Morehouse to preach in his church, at his pulpit, to his congregation, the first question Moody asked his wife was how this young preacher had got on. Wives have a, a way of knowing a little bit better than their husbands, no matter how famous a preacher you may be. And his wife said to him, he has preached both nights from John chapter 3, verse 16. I think you will like him. He preaches a, a bit differently than you do, though. How was that? asked Moody, a little troubled. But after all, he's Moody. If you're preaching differently than me and you like him, hmm? even preachers can have pride. Well, she said, uh, he tells the people that God loves them. Radical. Even for the evangelist Moody. Moody said, he is wrong, but I will ask him to speak again tonight so I can hear him myself. 
thinking he would then correct the error of his ways. And Miss Moody said, I think you will agree with him after you hear him tonight. So Moody went down to the church. And the first thing he noticed was that everybody in the congregation had their Bibles. My friends, began Morehouse, this young preacher. My friends, if you will turn to the third chapter of John, in the 16th verse, you will find my text for today. He preached seven sermons in a row from that one text. John chapter 3, verse 16. And the last night, Morehouse went into the pulpit, and every eye was upon him, wondering what text he would preach from on his last night. And he began with these words. He said, friends, I have been hunting all day for a new text. But I cannot find one so good as the old one. So we will go back to the third chapter of John and the 16th verse. Moody said he could never forget the closing words of that young preacher's sermon on that final night. As Morehouse said this in his closing statement to the church, my friends, for a whole week I have been trying to tell you how much God loves you. But I cannot do it with this poor, stammering tongue. If I could borrow Jacob's ladder, if I could climb up to heaven, rung upon rung, and ask Gabriel himself, who stands in the presence of God Almighty, if I could ask Gabriel to tell you how much God loves sinners, all the covering cherub could say would be these words. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would just believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. There are no more powerful words in heaven or earth than that. There is nothing more radical than this gospel that has been given to you today. Is it your desire to re-radicalize those words, this gospel, our God, in our hearts, in our minds, and share this radically good news with the world? Is that your desire? If that is your desire, I just invite you to stand to your feet. Make a stand today. Stand if you will now commit those words that even the heaven's most mighty angel could not say it any better nor any clearer, God is love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being such a radical God. We thank you for giving us this radical truth. Now let us be your radical believers. And let us show the world what an amazing God we serve. What an amazing story. And above all, this is amazingly true. And one day soon, this God that the world cannot see, this world that the God cannot touch, this God is going to break through in through those clouds and the sky is going to be lit up like fire like this world has never seen. 
They are going to hear a trumpet sound the likes of which this world has never heard. And if they would just believe in the grace and the goodness and the love of you today, they will touch the nail pierced hands of the son that you gave to die for us. We have stood here making a commitment, Lord, radicalize this good news in our hearts and take us out to the world who is ready for us true Savior, a real Savior in Jesus Christ. And now, Father, today, there may be somebody, somebody here today who has never taken this radical Jesus into their life. But today, they have heard your call. They have heard the story, and they want to accept this free gift of grace. And by faith, they want to give their heart to you for the first time. If that's you today, if you hear God calling you your name, I invite you to step out the aisles and come right here. Come before his throne. Take my hand as his and give your heart to him. If you want to give your heart to him for the first time. If you have wandered from his fold and the devil has deceived as he has done to us all. And you have fallen, but today you want to get back on your feet and you want to give your heart again to the Lord and to recommit your soul to him. I invite you to step out the aisles and come here as well. You're not taking my hand, you're taking the hand of Jesus Christ who put those nails in his hand so he could give his hand to you today. Today. If you're watching online and you have heard his voice to you, I invite you, just click on the link on our website, My Next Step, and check on that box, I give my heart to Jesus. And make your commitment now and make that commitment sure. Heavenly Father, you have called your people. Now anoint us with the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Lift us up to where you are, but not us alone, but let us bring these, your people, through this radically good news of the gospel. Home in heaven with you. Until that day, my Father, we place ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 You may be seated. Amen. Amen. We want to continue in our worship through giving. And as I mentioned in the, um, the last service, you heard the, the campus spotlight. I think uh, for those of you who may not have been here, we have a huge campus outreach taking place on November 10th, right here at the University of Maryland. The A New Ministry, which is a collection of campus ministries throughout this Northeast Corridor, are holding their 10-year anniversary at the University of Maryland. And on that Sabbath, November 10th, they have rented out more than half the student union on a day of outreach and ministry to this campus. They are expecting over 100 students to come here from around the region and even as far out as California to worship and minister in our backyard. Can the church say amen? amen. Now, when we decided to come here to College Park, it was with an intention to serve and make an outreach and to bless this campus. And before this church could even begin to start, God said, I've already got something in the works, and we just need your support. Now, you heard Lena up here sharing a lot of the information with you last time. <coughs> and we made a commitment to collect $2,000 to help financially support this ministry. 
so they could provide the materials and stuff. And let me tell you some of the things that they're going to be taking place there on campus. They're going to have a health expo with medical professionals giving free clinical things and dental checkups to the university students. Amen? They're going to have a prayer wall over there for students that want to come out and say a prayer and be prayed for. They're going to have things like vegetarian taste tests to let them know, hey, it's not just healthy, but it tastes good too. Amen? They're going to have this giant statue of the metal man from Daniel chapter 2, and they're going to be passing out great controversy books because students come and see this giant inflatable thing wondering like what in the world is going out over here and they get to share the message amen? amen all of these campus ministerial students are coming to your neighborhood your community college park to witness and they need our support now, they asked for $1,600, and I said, we need to bring $2,000 because we're not going to cut any corners on this 10-year anniversary. They're expecting over 100 contacts from university students to come through this event. And Lena, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're expecting about 30 or 40 Bible study students to come out of those contact lists based on their reception at other campuses. God is at work. Now, by God's grace, we collected over $700 off our last service alone. We got $1,300 to go. We can make it happen. Amen? Amen? Now, if you want to give to this project, on your tithe envelope in front of you, just write the words campus ministry. For those of you watching us online, we invite for you, and even those of you who are here who didn't bring something, we invite you to give online. You're going to see the website right here, livingwatersda.org slash give. And in the drop-down, you can select campus ministry. All the funds given to campus ministry is going to go towards this awesome conference. And that we as a church will be going to, amen? We're going to hear more about that, how we can be there on campus to support them on that Sabbath. So I invite you to give towards the campus ministry. But don't forget your tithes and offerings as well. Amen? Without your giving, your sacrificial giving to the local church budget, this church can exist to be a part of the ministry such as this campus outreach, to be a, exist to support the relief efforts for these hurricane victims and all the many things going on here. So as the Lord impresses your heart and calls you to give sacrificially, just remember, no matter what you give, you're going to receive so much more in return because you can never, ever outgive God's giving. Amen? Amen? Amen. So as the deacons prepare to come forward to, to collect today's giving, I invite Brother Stephen to come for us and share with us another musical selection, lifting us up to his throne of grace. Thank you, my brother.
sing a song. I know you guys know this song, so just sing along with me. heads with me. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the graces and the mercy that you've bestowed upon us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the means to be able to contribute to uh, the movement you're doing here on this campus. Thank you for the man of God you've put over this place. Thank you for the message of grace that you've given us. God, help us to receive that in our lives. Help us to receive the fact that you love us. Help us to receive the fact that you forgive us. Help us to receive the fact that you see us as your daughters and your sons. Help us to live in that light every single day. And that let people see as we live under the joy of your grace that they too can find a friend in you. Thank you, Lord, for the message of your love. Thank you for giving us your son. And we thank you, Lord, for each other. Thank you for the brothers and sisters that I have here today. 
We give you all the praise and the thanks. Thank you for being with us and for protecting us and for being there when we've screwed up, when we haven't done ever all the right things. You've been there, God. You've been there protecting us. And thank you for being our help. We give you all the praise and, and blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Were you blessed today? Was God good in this place? Amen. Brother Stephen, thank you for just lifting us up once again. I think I speak in behalf of the whole music crew. You always have a home over here. Always a spot over for you. Amen. Amen. But just a couple closing announcements before we uh, let you guys go. There is a delicious potluck luncheon waiting for you downstairs. So please don't leave because there's so much food over there. So we need help to eat this thing. So I invite you all to just come downstairs and join us for fellowship and lunch. And we also want to remind everybody, um, if you are interested in joining our outreach team on the prayer walk, then I invite you to meet Elder Ian, who is on the piano. You'll see him downstairs, and he'll have your outreach t-shirt. That's a free gift for you to take and to keep and give you instructions on what to do as you go out. A reminder, our next service is actually next week, October 6th. So take a look on your flyer card that you should have got in your bulletin right on the back, all the dates for the rest of this year's service. Now, some of you may know we are meeting twice a month now till the end of the year. We're meeting essentially on days that the home football team is not playing. So if you wonder why the dates are what they are, the church parking lot is rented out on those dates for the football game. So our schedule is kind of here or there. Hold on to this bulletin. You'll see the date. So our next service is next week, next Sabbath, October 6th. So we hope to see you here. You'll also find those dates on our website and printed in the bulletin as well. Um, also, just a reminder, uh, not only are we collecting donations for this campus outreach that's taking place November 10th via new conference, but some of the students who are visiting here from out of state need a place to stay for the night. If you can have a place to stay for a student, it might be one or two, maybe it's a male or female, whatever works for you. If you can house a student for one night, some of them may even have their own transportation, so it's just to stay over the night. Please let me know or fill in your next step form here and just hand it to me on your way out saying I can house a student with your information and we'll be in touch. We do want to find a home for these students. Many of them can't afford to stay in a hotel and things like that. And they're coming here to minister to your community. So the least we can do is give them a nice home to stay for the night. Amen? Amen. So if that's you, please fill out a next step form give it to me, or, or fill it in online. You can do that as well on our website on the My Next Step form. Um, lastly, just a, a, a word we want to share. If the, put up the slide, our kids' security. So you know that uh, our number one priority in the church is to make sure our children are safe. Amen? Amen. 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 And I've been working with the head deacon and some security personnel about plans and policies in place over here that we continue to adjust on a weekly site service just to make things as secure as possible. But the best security system God made is you, the parents. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we are asking you to always be aware of where your kids are. You know, sometimes we've seen kids playing outside through the windows during lunch, but we haven't seen adults out there. Or we've seen one and we see 10 kids. We can get outnumbered. If your kids are outside, it's okay, but be there with them. If they're in the halls or wherever, be there with them. Because we don't have enough volunteers to watch all the children. So please, be aware of where your kids are at all times. Our volunteers have been trained. If they see kids on their own someplace, they're going to bring them back in. Sorry, no offense. We want to bring them where it's safe. 
Amen? Amen. Lastly, uh, this is just something to be aware of for today. Please nobody go toward the grass uh, against this wall on the right-hand side of the parking lot. We were told that there is a beehive underground, and there's like hundreds of bees under there. Now, they are, uh, they are, they are being exterminated. They're in the process of. Now, I just found this out as we came in today. So just be aware of that. Uh, stay away from that side. No one should be playing over there anyway, but they're under the leaves, and they're actually made their home underground. Exterminators are coming this week to take care of that. So just be aware. Children, adults, everybody, don't go out there. They're not happy as it is, all right? So let's stay inside and fellowship. Let's stay inside and have our potluck. Amen? Amen. With that, I'm going to invite the praise team to come up here, lead us on out, and I will see you guys downstairs. Praise God and have a blessed, blessed week. I'll see you back here next Sabbath. Amen.